We truly hope you enjoy the special you are about to hear about the birth of Jesus Christ. This presentation was put together in November and December of 2011 by DeeperTruthBlog.com. Before we proceed with the special, we feel we must make a distinction to avoid confusion. We actually refer to three different calendars during this presentation. Today's Gregorian calendar, which centers the existence of time starting from the birth of Christ. The Jewish civil calendar, in which the new year starts on Rosh Hashanah in September slash October of the year. And finally, the Jewish ecclesiastical calendar, which begins on one Nisan, which is equivalent to the beginning of the month of April under our calendar. Because of the common ascension method of dating, a new year begins on the first of Nisan, according to the ecclesiastical calendar. We hope you enjoy this special, The Case for December 25th, 2 B.C. Was Jesus Christ our Savior indeed born on Christmas Day, or do the songs and the traditions have it wrong? Can we piece together from scripture, from history, and even from science, the mystery of what date Jesus Christ was born on? We believe we can, and the answer may surprise you. Listen closely as we build for you the case for December 25th of 2 BC. Now we know that, in the end, the birth date of Jesus has no weight on your salvation, be it on December 25th or September 11th, as some have suggested. However, we hope this special will remove some doubts you may have and help you understand that the birth of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. We pray that that realization will be a life-changing epiphany. When trying to establish that which is historically in question, we must begin with what we know to be historically established fact. For this purpose, we start our journey on the 9th of Av, 70 AD. The Jewish fast date of Tisha B'Av commemorates the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem, both the first and second temples. Both were destroyed on the 9th of Av first in 587 BC and the second in 70 AD. It was after the destruction of the first temple and building of the second that the first of the 24 priestly courses was set to commence on Tisha B'Av. The siege on the second temple was the bloodiest in human history. The Jewish historian Josephus lamented 
that the Roman soldiers actually had to navigate mounds of dead bodies to continue their extermination. In the end, more than one million were killed, men, women, children, priests, all were exterminated, just as the Bible had foretold. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who were in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who were in the midst of the city must leave, and those who were in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how many times I yearned to gather your children together as a hen gathers her young under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house will be abandoned, desolate. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth became illumined by his splendor. He cried out in a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a haunt for demons. She is a cage for every unclean spirit, a cage for every unclean bird, a cage for every unclean and disgusting beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her licentious passion. The kings of the earth had intercourse with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her drive for luxury. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Depart from her, my people, so as not to take part in her sins, and receive a share in her place. For her sins are piled up to the sky, and God remembers her crimes. Pay her back as she has paid others. Pay her back double for her deeds. Into her cup pour double what she poured. To the measure of her boasting and wantonness, repay her in torment and grief. For she said to herself, I sit enthroned as queen. I am no widow, and I will never know grief. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, pestilence, grief, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Fellow Deeper Truth member, Donald Hartley. Well, we're going back to the siege of Jerusalem that took place in 70 AD when the Romans finally was able to take control of uh, the, the area. And Jerusalem was the last holdout, or one of the last holdouts uh, of defiance against uh, Rome. And I suppose there were many within the walls of Jerusalem who was trusting that God would deliver them and save them, but that's not what Jesus promised or prophesied. Jesus said it would fall, and it did in 70 AD. And Josephus, the one of the Jewish historians of the time, relates that the uh, capture of Jerusalem was brutal, that just about every able-bodied man was taken and crucified along the roads leading to Jerusalem and this crucifixion the, the mass of it was like a forest the bloodshed was was horrendous and unfortunately many Protestants today are preparing for such an event now but um, you know but this has already happened at least in the biblical sense it has already happened and this happened on what we know as the ninth of Av the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple took place at the very same day that Babylon overtook Jerusalem and went into and desecrated the temple 587 BC and 70 AD are both uh, simultaneously at the same on the same day uh, taken over and desecrated and that both of them were prophesied one by Daniel Daniel the prophet prophesied it uh, the first time around and then Jesus prophesied it the second time around and this is very important as to knowing the day that uh, we utilize this as uh, knowing the day in which Jesus was born Donald does not overstate the case for in knowing 
that the temple schedule was reset to begin on the 9th of Av is critical. You see, you find the original schedule of the priestly courses in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. The first course, Jehoiarib, starts at the beginning of the Jewish calendar year, 1 Nisan. It is knowing that these priestly courses were rescheduled that keeps us from making the mistake that many evangelicals do today by referring back to the original schedule. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the priestly division of Abijah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in the eyes of God, observing all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Once, when he was serving as priest in his division's turn before God, according to the practice of the priestly service, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to burn incense. Then, when the whole assembly of the people was praying outside at the hour of the incense offering, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled by what he saw, and fear came upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Please allow me to put this to you in terms that you would understand. If the priestly rotation were still in effect today, in 2011, Tisha B'Av would have fallen on the evening of August 8th. That would have been the beginning of the rotation. The course of Abijah, the course that Zechariah belonged to, would have then started their service on September 26th of 2011. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. The sixth month would have ended on about March 25th, when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and announces that she will bear a son. Adding nine months for Mary's pregnancy, we arrive, of course, at about December 25th. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region, living in the fields, and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Messiah and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go then to Bethlehem to see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds.
Before we go deeper into our exploration of the evidence, let us pause and tackle one of the most common, yet misguided, objections. There are those who claim that it is impossible for Jesus to have been born in December, because the census wouldn't have been held in December because of the winter, and it would have been impossible for the sheep to be guarding their flock by night around the hills of Bethlehem. The fact of the matter is that the city of Bethlehem is a mere seven miles from the city of Jerusalem. The average high temperature for December in the city of Jerusalem is 57 degrees. The average low temperature is 42 degrees. Further, in the latter part of December, the rains break and the fields around the town of Bethlehem in the hills are covered with lush green grass perfect for grazing sheep. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments roll in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. 
from the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In order to delve further into trying to establish the date of the birth of Christ, it is helpful to try and establish the year of the birth of Christ. There are some clues in the Gospels that are very helpful for doing this. The first is in Luke chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. We start by establishing the beginning of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now Tiberius Caesar co-reigned with Augustus for two years. Then, on August 19th, of 14 AD, Caesar Augustus died. Approximately a month later, Tiberius was officially pronounced Caesar. So this means, chronologically speaking, the beginning of the first year of Tiberius Caesar was September 15, 14 AD. But that's not the way Luke is counting it. What Luke does here is what's known as common ascension dating. It was one of the most common methods of dating the reign of a political figure. Using this method of dating, Luke actually begins counting the reign of Tiberius Caesar on the first day of the first year of the Jewish calendar after Tiberius takes the throne. This would be 1 Nisan AD 15 or April 1st by our reckoning. So the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would have began on 1 Nisan 30 AD with the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist followed very shortly after by the ministry of Jesus Christ. When Jesus began his ministry he was about 30 years of age. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Before we continue, I must deal with one commonly raised objection. Those who deny that Luke was actually using common ascension dating in this case. I believe I can prove that he was. And I will attempt to prove it by determining the death of Jesus Christ. Now we know in the Gospels that there are four Passovers mentioned. The first Passover is the Passover almost immediately after the miracle at Cana. The last Passover was the meal they were preparing for that became the Last Supper. Now we know that Jesus died on a Friday that immediately preceded the Passover. And there are only two possible dates for this. April of 30 AD and April of 33 AD. Well, the April 30 AD is problematic whether you use chronological dating or common ascension dating. In either case, there's not enough time between the beginning of Jesus' ministry to the end of it. The April 3rd, 33 AD provides us a much better date. There's something else that happened on that date that did not happen on the 30 AD date, and that is that there was an eclipse on that date. And we know that there was an eclipse on the date of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The clincher for me is the prophecy of the 70 weeks in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel that actually predicts the date of the crucifixion of the death of the Christ. 
Biblical scholars have examined this and determined mathematically that this prophecy actually points to the exact date, April 3rd, 33 AD, as the date of the crucifixion of Jesus. As I mentioned before, if this date immediately precedes the fourth Passover that's mentioned in the Gospels, April of 33 AD, then the third Passover is 32 AD, the second is 31 AD, and the first is 30 AD. This proves that Jesus was 30 years old, or about 30 years old, in the year 30 AD. But just to hammer it home, is there additional evidence in the scriptures to support this conclusion? Yes, there is. We go to the second chapter of John's Gospel. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen, and spilled the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves he said, Take these out of here, and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And 
Before we get into the statement by the Pharisees that the temple in Jerusalem had been in, under construction for 46 years and determine what time frame that points to, let's take a brief diversion and talk about the temple in Jerusalem. Now when Jesus says, if you tear this temple down, I will raise it in three days, he was talking about the temple of his body. But the Pharisees didn't understand that. They thought he was talking about the physical temple. To explain how unthinkable it would be that the temple in Jerusalem would ever be torn down, let me give you some statistics and facts about the temple. The majority of the stones used in the construction of the temple in Jerusalem weighed in excess of 56,000 pounds each. Some of the stones that weighed as much as 160,000 pounds were elevated to a height of 100 feet in the construction of the temple. The heaviest stones were placed at the base of the temple and the heaviest stone is estimated to have been in excess of 1 million pounds. Quite a feat to move those stones into place and construct the temple in Jerusalem and it's understandable how the Jews would believe that the temple would never fall. The temple in Jerusalem was a massive structure. Recently, Deeper Truth contributor Ross Earl Hoffman traveled to the Holy Land as a guest of Catholic apologist Steve Ray. And he called in live from Jerusalem to the show and had these comments to make about how the temple in Jerusalem was central to all of the whole city. This is such a wonderful thing to have Steve here, so let's keep this moving. I want you to picture this. This whole scene we're, we're picturing. Now picture the temple right in the middle of this. I mean, if you can picture the temple, I mean, I, you have to see this to believe it. I mean, we come into the Wailing Wall, and good Lord, I mean, I've never been around our, our Jewish brothers and stuff, but it, that was insane too. I, I mean, here we have the temple right in the middle of all of this, and, and around it are each of these spots where Jesus interacted, and, and, and it's just... It's almost impossible to put it into words. Once again, I'm talking to Donald Hartley. Donald, the building of Herod's temple, which it was actually not a new temple, but a renovation of the existing temple, uh, it was quite an undertaking, was it not? It was quite an undertaking because of the importance that was given by the uh, Sanhedrin and the religious leaders that he had to have all the pieces in place in order to even just begin the project and that would be a right I think I think that would be a good concern that the Sanhedrin would have had at that time because you know this would have been a breakup of what was going on so uh, and the reason for that was that they wanted the temple sacrifice to continue right, right unabated exactly so so they wanted there to be no real uh, uh, gap if you will between the time that parts of the the old temple were taken down and rebuilt now we know that the sanctuary was con uh, was completed uh, rather quickly that was, that was, yeah that was given the highest priority because of the position that the sanctuary holds in the worship of uh, the connection between God and his people in the Old Testament. The construction of the temple itself, however, was something different. 1,000 carts of stone had to be accumulated and 1,000 priests had to be trained to be stone cutters. This would have taken a considerable amount of time. But just how long remains unclear. At what time did the actual building of the temple commence? Well, the Jewish website jewishmag.com actually gives us a hint. In telling us that the temple stood for a total of 80 years, Herod's temple, being completed in 64 AD. Well, 64 AD minus 80 years takes us to 16 BC for the beginning of the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. After moving forward the 46 years prescribed by the Pharisees, we arrive 
again at 30 AD. Dr. Gregory Thompson of Deeper Truth. Uh, Dr. Greg, some people may be confused with us saying that he was born in December of 2 BC, how that adds up to uh, 30 years old and 30 AD. Uh, could you explain, please? Well, there's actually no uh, zero uh, at that moment in time. And so when he was born in, uh, in December 25th of uh, 2 BC, in, in uh, uh, January 1st, uh, he would have been uh, eight days old. and then, uh, That's January 1st of 1 BC. Of 1 BC. He would have been eight days old. So on January 1st of 1 AD, he would have been how old? January 1st of 1 AD, he would have been one year and eight days old. So then it fits perfectly that on 30 AD, in the spring of 30 AD, Jesus Christ would have been... He would have been 30 years old, yes. So we have established pretty definitively that Jesus was about 30 years old in 30 AD and therefore was born early in the year 1 BC or late in the year 2 BC. Is there anything more definitive in Jewish history and tradition to substantiate this? Well actually there is. On a call with Deeper Truth contributor Jojo Hawkins from the continent of Africa she added these thoughts. John, did you know that, you know with Hanukkah, the feast moves, the Jewish festival of lights? Yes. The feast moves. Now, normally it falls on the 25th of December, which causes a lot of confusion amongst the Jewish children, thinking they're celebrating Christmas. And this year, it starts on the 20th, and on the fifth night, the children are given presents of money. And the fifth night this year will fall on the 25th once again. Wow. Yeah. So, so when you say that it moves, what, what is the reason why it moves? It, well, the Jews do a lot of things according to the moon. Whereas some of the Christian feasts are set according to the date, whereas some move, like um, our Easter moves, right? When Lent right. starts from year to year, it changes. Okay, so now, wasn't it part of the early, early church tradition that Jesus was born during the Festival of Lights, during Hanukkah? Because he is the light, and John tells us he came into the world as the light. So what about the objection that we hear We hear uh, um, evangelicals uh, say where he, it says where he made his dwelling among us. Yes. They say that the literal translation of that is that he, uh, that he tabernacled among us. Is that a valid objection? I, I don't think that's a valid objection at all because he fulfills all of the Jewish feasts. He definitely does tabernacle among us. That's why we have tabernacles. So they, they've got a part, they've got an understanding, but it's absolutely incorrect because if you look at the scriptures, the Jews knew the dates. They kept the dates. They'd say on the X date of the this month of the this year. You know, dates were important to Jews. And if you knew you were going to be bearing the child that was to be God, would you not know the date he was born? Isn't that bizarre? The late father William Most establishes the death of Herod the Great as having occurred in 1 BC and does so based on referencing the book The Star That Astonished the World by E.L. Martin. Quoting Father Most, quote, The date of the birth of Christ hinges on just one thing, the statement of Josephus, Antiquity 17.6-8, that Herod died shortly after an eclipse of the moon. Astronomers supply the dates for such eclipses around those years none in 7 or 6 BC, in 5 BC, March 23rd, 29 days to Passover, also in 5 BC, September 15th, 7 months to Passover, 
In 4 BC, March 13th, 29 days to Passover. In 3 and 2 BC, no eclipses. In 1 BC, January 10th, 12 and a half weeks to Passover. Josephus also tells us what events happened between the eclipse and the Passover. He quotes Martin's book, pages 85 to 87. They would occupy probably about 12 weeks. Martin also shows that the eclipse of September 15th, 5 BC could not have fit with known data, especially the fact that Herod was seriously ill in Jericho, over 800 feet below sea level, when the eclipse happened. But Jericho was a furnace of heat at that time. September 15th, Herod would not have stayed there when he could have had the much better climate of Jerusalem. But if the eclipse was in midwinter, January 10th, Herod would find Jericho comfortable. So Herod died in 1 BC, and the birth of Christ cannot be put too much earlier than that. Close quote. The Jewish historian Josephus gives two indications of the length of the rule of Herod. A. He says Herod had a reign of 37 years from the time he was proclaimed king by the Romans, and B. 34 years after the death of Antigonus, which happened just after Herod took Jerusalem. Herod took Jerusalem late in 36 BC. Josephus said Herod's siege of Jerusalem was during a sabbatical year, and 36 was a sabbatical year. Otherwise, we would need to be seven years before or after 36 BC. Also, all sabbatical years ended on Yom Kippur. Josephus said Herod's capture of Jerusalem coincided with Yom Kippur. He and the Jews would remember it well. For it was an outrage to press a siege on Yom Kippur. Josephus said it was 27 years to the day that Pompey committed his abominations, which he did in 63 BC. This gives again 36 BC for Herod's capture of Jerusalem. If we use the common ascension method of counting years of rule, the date to start his 34 years is the first of Nisan, 35 BC. So Herod's 34th year of rule would start with the first of Nisan in 2 BC and end with the first of Nisan in 1 BC. Now 34 years after 35 BC would give 1 BC for the death and the end of Herod his death soon after the eclipse of January 10th, 1 BC. Every case has its linchpin moment the point in which the case is either won or lost. We believe that we have proven that Jesus Christ was indeed born near the end of 2 BC, the beginning of 1 BC. And now we'll present the final piece of our puzzle, the piece that we believe proves Jesus Christ was born December 25th, 2 BC. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. Notice that Matthew says that Herod attempted to ascertain the point at which the Magi first saw the star at its rising. 
We believe this is a very important clue. And we believe that this happened in September of 3 BC, about the time that Zechariah was getting his message in the temple. From the website BethlehemStar.net Jupiter, the name of the greatest god of Roman mythology and the name of the largest planet of our solar system. Jupiter has been known from ages old to the present as the king planet. The greatest of planets is a gas giant, approximately 11 times the size of Earth and over 300 times more massive. It circles the sun far beyond Earth in an orbit of about 12 years duration. In ancient times, planets like Jupiter were considered wandering stars since humans have assigned kingly qualities to this giant wanderer for dozens of centuries. Might it have had something to do with our star announcing the birth of a king? That will be our working theory. It's not enough to have a kingly name and reputation, of course. To be Matthew's star, Jupiter as viewed from Earth would have to do peculiar things. More precisely, as considered by Amagus, viewing from the Middle East during the years 3 and 2 BC, Jupiter's movements would have to satisfy all nine identifying characteristics of the star. In September of 3 BC, at the time of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, Jupiter began to do just that. Amagus watching Jupiter that September saw two objects moving so closely that they appeared to touch. This close approach of celestial bodies is sometimes called a conjunction. Our Middle Eastern viewers saw Jupiter coming into a close conjunction with the star Regalius. Regalius takes its name from the word root which yields our word regal. The Babylonians called Regalius Shauru, which means king. The Romans called Regalius Rex, which means king. So to start things at the beginning of the new Jewish year, the planet of kings met the star of kings. This conjunction may have indicated kingship in a forceful way to a Babylonian magus satisfying one qualification for the star. But would it have startled him? Probably not. Jupiter glides slowly past Regalius about every 12 years. Let's assume our Magus enjoyed a 50-year career, say from age 20 to age 70. We don't know how old the Magi were, but if our man was in the second half of his career, he might have seen such a pass two or three times before. Jupiter's orbit wobbles relative to Regalius, so not every conjunction is as close as the one he saw in 3 BC. Perhaps our Magus recorded this event with some interest, but it is hard to imagine great excitement. Not from this alone. But of course, there is more. The planets move against the field of fixed stars. From Earth, they appear to be active. For example, were you to watch Jupiter each night for several weeks, you would see that it moves eastward through the starry field. Each night, Jupiter rises in the east, satisfying a second star qualification. Each night it appears to be slightly farther east in the field of fixed stars. All of the planets move like this. But the wandering stars exhibit another, stranger motion. Periodically they appear to reverse course and move backward through the other stars. This may seem odd, but the reason is simple enough. We watch the planets from a moving platform, Earth, hurling around the sun in its own orbit. When you pass a car on the freeway, it appears to go backward as it drops behind. For similar reasons, when the Earth in its orbit swings past another planet, that planet appears to move backwards against the starry field. Astronomers call this optical effect retrograde motion. In 3-2 BC, Jupiter's retrograde motion, wandering, would have called for our Magus's full attention. After Jupiter and Regalius had their kingly encounter, Jupiter continued on a path through the star field. But when it entered retrograde, it changed its mind and headed back to Regalius for a second conjunction. After the second pass, it reversed course again for yet a third rendezvous with Regalius, a triple conjunction. A triple pass like this is more rare. Over a period of months, our watching Magus would have seen the planet of kings dance out 
a halo above the Star of Kings, a coronation. Jupiter's interesting behavior may explain the kingly aspect of the star, but there are nine qualifications of the Star of Bethlehem. Many are still missing. How did Jupiter's movement relate to the Jewish nation? Is its association with the Jewish New Year enough? Where is an indication of a birth? Some might say that the triple conjunction by itself would indicate to a Magus that a new king was on the scene. Now let's pick up the story with a summation from Father Most. In the evening of June 17, 2 BC, there was a spectacular astronomical event in the western sky. Venus moved eastward, seemingly going to collide with Jupiter. They appeared as one star, not two, dominating the twilight of the western sky in the direction of Palestine. This conjunction had not happened for centuries, would not happen again for more centuries. Jupiter was considered the father, Venus the mother. Then, not many days later, Venus came within 0.36 degrees of Mercury. On September 11th came the new moon, the Jewish New Year. This happened when Jupiter, the king planet, was approaching Regalius, the king star. Further, there were three conjunctions of Jupiter and Regalius within the constellation of Leo the Lion, which was considered the head of the zodiac. Now Genesis 49.10 had foretold that there would always be a ruler from Judah, whom Jacob called the Lion, until the time of the Messiah. Leo was dominated by the star Regalius, which astronomers called the King Star. The Magi, being astronomers and astrologers, would surely read these signs. The three conjunctions with Regalius were August 12, 3 BC, February 17, 2 BC, and May 8, 9, 2 BC. In Hebrew, Jupiter was called Sedek, righteous, a term specially pertaining to the Messiah. On September 11th, Jupiter was close in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. On September 3rd of 3 BC, Jupiter was in conjunction with Regalius, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo. Leo the Lion, which was associated with kings, and the Lion of Judah, as foretold by the dying Jacob in Egypt in Genesis 49.10. On December 25th of 2 BC, Jupiter stopped for six days over Bethlehem. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house they saw the child with Mary his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. Deeper Truth Blog contributors Dr. Gregory Thompson and Margie Prox Sindelar. Well, I, I feel like uh, as far as actual knowledge, uh, like I said before, I was a cradle Catholic, just accepted it, but I've gone from uh, kindergarten to uh, at least uh, the ninth, eighth or ninth grade, <laughs> and as soon as I listened a couple more times to your uh, to the, what you're getting ready to put out, which I think is a beautiful gift to all of us, I think it'd be a great gift to have before Christmas. Uh, it's going to uh, you know take me on into uh, uh, graduate level, and I, I, I love that, and I'm going to uh, really study study that uh, a lot. And uh, as far as my, I've always had a great uh, reverence uh, for the true meaning of Christmas, but this uh, can't help but validate uh, elements of that that I've always uh, felt like, uh, you know, the world's tried to take away from us. Well, listening tonight, uh, John, um, it just, the word wonder comes to mind. You know, when I think of uh, the Incarnation and being in the Advent season, it's what a great time to to go through this like you did for us. And uh, it just makes me think about how almighty a God we worship. Um, you know, it, it, He just didn't randomly come on a particular day. 
everything, everything he did, every, you know, every moment, every backdrop, every, uh, you know, everything has a meaning. And it, and what a gift, um, you know, that we can now, 2,000 years later, uh, go back and put it all together and, and look at the way the stars were. And it, and it does, like you said, it, you can imagine what those shepherds, uh, you know, felt out there in that field. And, uh, you know, the wise men, it brings new meaning to the song, uh, you know, the refrain, O oh, star of wonder, star of might, westward leading, still proceeding. And, and like you said, it was going westward. Uh, so uh, what a great uh, way to renew um you know, your childhood wonder in the Christmas season. Awesome. born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, the blessed angel came and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name O oh, tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy Now 